Sensation is the process whereby your senses pick up visual, auditory, or other sensory information. You can think of sensation as just taking in that raw material from the environment and then, you know, detecting that material and then transmitting it to the brain. Sensations, those are, that, that's like the raw material. And then you have perception. Perceptions are, well, perception is the process whereby that raw material is processed and transformed and organized into something that actually is understandable by the brain. So you can think of perception as the finished product. So sensations, you know, sensory information, it's detected by your different kinds of sensory receptors. These are just highly specialized cells all throughout your body that can detect certain kinds of environmental stimuli. Now, when that stimuli is detected, the process that occurs is called transduction. So transduction is when it just takes that environmental stimulus and converts it or transforms it into something that the brain can use. So transduction, to put it another way, is a process where, whereby your sensory re receptors convert sensory stimulation into a neural impulses. And Transduction isn't some bizarre psychological thing. It's, it's just a basic term. You know, a transducer is just some device that converts energy from one kind to another. So the two kinds of energy we're talking about here are sensations, you know, physical energy, and how that is transduced into perceptions, you know, the neural signals. So sensation and perception, they're not the same thing. And in fact, in many cases, they have very different kinds of information. So just because you sense it, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna perceive it. And just because you perceive it, it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that you sensed it. Well, what I'm trying to say is, your perceptual system, your perception is creative. Uh, it's creative in the sense that your sensory receptors provide very little information. And the information they do provide tends to be very ambiguous. So the consequence is then, when that information gets to the brain, it needs to try to make sense out of this, you know, ambiguous information that's full of holes. And what it does to try to make sense of that information is to literally, like, fill in those blanks, to fill in the holes, to piece together all these separate little parts. And d that kind of, you know, filling in of holes, that kind of piecing together, that's definitely a creative process. In most cases, these interpretations, these creative reproductions are accurate because the world we live in, you know, is logical, it makes sense. But we can take advantage of this by uh, producing illusions. And that's how illusions work. Illusions work by way of tricking your creative perceptual mind. But here's another example about how uh, perception is creative. There's actually a blind spot in each of your eyes where you literally are getting no visual information at all. So if you look around your visual field, you're not going to find it. There's no part of your visual field that is missing information, but in, in reality, there is. There's a big hole. So here's how you can find, your, find the hole in your visual field. You have to close one of your eyes. So if you close your left eye, just stick out your, your right thumb, put it directly in front of your eye, and kind of look behind the thumb. So look at where the thumb is, but don't follow it, and move your thumb slightly to the right. So keep your eye still while moving your thumb to the right, and once you move it about that much, so you see how much I moved it? Once you move it about that much, your thumb will disappear. Once you get it to disappear, you'll notice that if you move it up, it'll come back. If you move it down, it'll come back. If you move it right, it'll come back. And if you move it left, it'll come back. So there's like a little hole right there. If you can't get it to work, don't, don't feel too bad. I took my mother like at least a half hour just to figure this out. So your perceptual system is creative. You know, it's filling in those blanks. And the, 
your sensory system, though, besides just being creative, it's also adapting to the environment. So sensory adaptation is the process whereby your sensory receptors grow accustomed to constant, unchanging levels of stimuli over time. To put it more simply, your sensory systems are always kind of resetting themselves to a neutral value, to a neutral state. So for vision, that would just be like a blank gray. For hearing, that would be like white noise or silence. For a lot of the other senses, it would just be, you know, lack of information, to put it simply. So this is why you don't notice things as much after you've been exposed to them for a while. I'm sure we've all had the experience where, you know, maybe you get home from a hard day at work and you find out that nobody took out the garbage and it stinks in the house now. The whole house smells like garbage. But you're just, you're tired. Uh, you don't want to deal with it. So you just kind of put up with the smell and you go about your life. Well, you'll probably notice after a short period of time, the smell doesn't really bother you as much anymore. In fact, you might not even notice it anymore. And then somebody else comes in the room and they smell the garbage and they're just like, ah, what, why isn't this bothering you? Well, you should reply by saying, I've adapted. Now, it's very easy to uh, you know, experience, to see the effects of this adaptation with certain senses, like vision. Because with vision, you, if, if you keep your eyes still and if you stare at something long enough, you'll notice that when that image is removed or when you look away, you'll see a negative after image. You'll see this negative after effect. And that occurs for all your senses. But with vision, why, well, why don't you try it out? So here is a picture. I want you to just stare at one point in this picture, like stare at the nose. Now don't move your eyes. If you, if you have really twitchy eyes, it's not going to work. So you have to stare and keep your eyes perfectly still. So while I'm talking, you are adapting. Your visual system is taking in this information, getting used to it, and adjusting itself accordingly. So now that when I remove the picture and present just a white screen, now you see the negatives of whatever it is you adapted to. And that works the same way for all of your senses. Your perception is creative, your, sensations are your sensory systems are adapting, and your sensory systems are also interacting with each other. What I'm saying is the activity of one sensory system, like vision, will influence others, like hearing or smell or touch. Under most circumstances, this is good. This is helpful. You know, it, if, if you're looking at something, it should, the, the, the way it looks should correspond with the way it sounds and feels and tastes and touch, right? It's very rare that you ever, in the real world, have this kind of disconnection between your senses where they don't give you corresponding information. Like I said, this doesn't, the, your senses normally correspond perfectly well in the normal world. But once we start experimentally, like in the laboratory, once we start n disallowing that correspondence, once we start presenting different kinds of information to your different sensory systems, you get some really interesting consequences. One example of this would be the McGurk effect. The McGurk effect is this multi-sensory phenomenon where the visual movements of a speaker's mouth do not correspond with what you're actually hearing. So you'll know you're experiencing the McGurk effect if you look at a person speaking and you hear one thing, but when you close your eyes, you hear something else. So I have included a link to an example of the McGurk effect in the comments. Just make sure you check that out. It's really interesting. Perceptual systems are creative, they're adapting, they're interacting, and they're also learning. So what I mean is every time you expose yourself to certain kinds of stimuli, you get better at perceiving them. So this is why people who have had a lot of training in you know, understanding certain kinds of stimuli like an x-ray scan, people like doctors who have seen a lot of x-ray scans, they are better at detecting important pieces of information in that scan. So when I look at an x-ray, uh, I don't know what I'm looking for. I don't know what's important. I don't know how to read this information. But to them, it's obvious. So they have developed these kinds of perceptual expectancies where their past experiences, their motives, the context of the situation, they just allow that, that individual to perceive certain kinds of information in a certain way. Now, if you do any kind of research on sensation and perception, 
you're probably going to be doing psychophysics. Uh, we use psychophysics to just look at this link between per sensation and perception, and one of the primary things that we do regarding to that is what you can detect. So we measure something called the absolute threshold for various stimuli. The absolute threshold marks the difference between not being able to perceive a stimulus and just barely being able to perceive the stimulus. So it's the minimum amount, minimum amount of sensory stimulation detected half of the time. Here's an example of what I mean by the absolute threshold. So this is just a white screen, and I want you to tell me the moment at which you notice there is some coloration. So as soon as you notice coloration, that is where your absolute threshold is. And for most people, it's probably right about here. If you still can't see it, then you should probably go to see the optometrist. So besides absolute, absolute threshold, we also measure something called the difference threshold. This is a measure of the smallest increase or decrease in a physical stimulus required to produce a, what's called a just notice, noticeable difference. So this is the smallest change in sensation a person is able to detect half the time. So not, it's, now it's not about, do you notice something? Now it's about, has something changed? Let's do another example. So here you see a blue ball. And I'm going to start progressively changing this ball in some way. And I want you to you know, try to find the point at which you notice that it has changed. And that is your just noticeable difference. And for most people, it's probably right about here. So the last thing I want to mention, just about sensation and perception in general, before we get into any more like specific kinds of things, is signal detection theory. So signal detection theory it is, was developed to try to explain how we make sense of the world. Because in the real world, stimuli are ambiguous. You always kind of have to make a judgment call as to whether or not you actually heard that thing you thought you heard or saw that thing you thought you saw. In most cases, you can make a pretty good prediction, but you're not always right. And that's because of environmental noise. Now, when I say noise, I don't mean that, you know, I don't necessarily mean auditory sounds. What I mean is just stuff that you don't care about. Like, the, the signal you're trying to detect is hidden in all this meaningless noise, right? Um, a really good example I like talking about is children who are afraid of the dark. So children, the reason they're afraid of the dark is because they are thinking that they're detecting signals. They're thinking that they're, they're detecting something in that darkness, you know, like a monster that's going to eat them. They think they detect a signal in the darkness, but they're not sure because that darkness makes it ambiguous. That darkness, that's the noise in this case. So because there's a lot of noise, because there's a lot of darkness, they're not certain that what they're seeing or hearing is a monster or not. So whenever a child is in that kind of a situation where they're you know, in a dark room and they think they may have seen a monster but they're not sure, now they have to make a decision. So that's what signal detection theory is all about, is making a deci decision and considering the consequences of your decision. Children don't you know, chart this out when they're making a decision, but this is what's going through their head. What they're, what they're asking themselves is, is there a monster? Well, if their answer is yes, then the next thing you need to do is make a decision. So, should you cry for mommy? If you say yes, then you've made the right decision. There was a monster and your mommy saved you. Congratulations, you will not be eaten today. But if there is a monster and they decide not to cry for mommy, then that's horrible, you know, they're gonna get eaten. So they want to try to avoid that consequence at all costs. So in general, children will not say, they will not decide to leave mommy alone. They'll decide that they should always cry for mommy because they're really, really trying hard to avoid that severe negative consequence.